on BBC News. Friday night on BBC One. Now, Great Britain's seven largest political parties respond to the questions that matter to you in the election debate, hosted by Michelle Hussein. You can watch this with signing on the BBC News channel. Seven political parties, seven leading figures who believe they have the answers to the UK's future. Welcome to the BBC election debate. to all of you watching and to our live audience here in the BBC Radio Theatre at Broadcasting House in London. With less than four weeks to polling day, the parties with us tonight are here because of their performance in recent elections and their standing in opinion polls. The invitation was for leaders or leading figures to take part. And tonight, the seven debaters with us are... For the Conservatives, Penny Morden, the leader of the House of Commons, the leader of Reform UK, Nigel Farage. Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner. Reena Bjorworth, the leader of Plaid Cymru, the Party of Wales. Carla Denia, co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. The Liberal Democrats' deputy leader, Daisy Cooper. And the Scottish National Party's Westminster leader, Stephen Flynn. Now, the parties drew lots to decide their position on stage, and they stand before an audience who have been chosen by the pollsters, Savanta. They come from many different backgrounds, reflecting voters from across Great Britain. They include supporters of the seven parties represented here, as well as some undecided voters. They may come to this with strong views, or they may find themselves persuaded by something they hear from the stage. And the questions that you will hear in the next 90 minutes will come from the audience. The time will go fast. We need to make sure all seven get their say, and there will be times that I move them on or call a halt. Meanwhile, journalists and other representatives of the parties are gathered in our spin room where there will be reaction to the live debate. And so, to the first of tonight's questions, and it comes from Francis Gottesman. As we celebrate D-Day and remember those like my father and so many others who served this country so well, how will the parties ensure our army is ready and our country is safe from another major conflict? Thank you, Mr. Gottesman. And let me turn first to Angela Rayner for Labour. Uh, thank you, Francis, and thank you to all those that have served in our armed forces and continue to do so in what is a very, you know, insecure world at the moment. First of all, Labour's committed to the triple lock on nuclear deterrent, especially in the climate that we're in, which means we will keep our nuclear deterrent, that we will make sure that the four submarines are built in Barrow and that we will continue with the upgrades. We will have a commitment to the 2.5% spending of GDP, which obviously is very important. And I think one of the other things that is a real scandal at the moment is our armed forces and the accommodation that they're given. So we will look at that issue as well. We want to make sure that everyone has secure, decent homes in the UK. Okay. Daisy Cooper for the Liberal Democrats. Well, the Liberal Democrats are the party of Paddy Ashdown, so it won't surprise you to know that we take defence very seriously. So first of all, we would maintain the nuclear deterrent that we have. An absolute priority for us is reversing the cuts to our troops of 10,000, which has happened under the Conservatives. Um, we would increase spending on defence year on year in the next Parliament with the ambition of reaching 2.5% by the end of the next <clears throat> Parliament. Uh, having decent homes for our veterans and for our, uh, our armed forces is incredibly important. I'm very proud of the fact that it was a Liberal Democrat amendment that tried to make sure that, that, we had, that every single home met the decent home standard. It was only because this general election was called that that particular piece of legislation fell, but it's a priority for us in the next Parliament. 
Nigel Farage, Reform UK. Well, Francis, you're right to ask the question. We're spending less on defence than we were in the last year of the Labour government. Pro rata. The army has shrunk from 100,000 to 72,000. Uh, recruitment is catastrophic. So rather than having a weird concept of national service where 30,000 youngsters would do a year, we need to recruit 30,000 people into the army full time. And yes, the veterans point's been made already. Respect our veterans, including those with the average age of 100 who were deserted by the Prime Minister in Normandy yesterday, which I think was a complete and utter disgrace and shows us we actually have a very unpatriotic Prime Minister. It was dreadful. But Penny Morden, can you respond to that, Rishi Sunak leaving the D-Day commemorations before the end of the day? What happened was completely wrong, and the Prime Minister has rightly apologised for that, apologised to veterans, but also to all of us, because he was representing all of us. I'm from Portsmouth. I've also been Defence Secretary, and my wish at the end of this week is that all of our veterans feel completely treasured. And I'm hoping tonight to convince you of some things that are important to them, important to their legacy. And I couldn't do that if I wasn't straight with you on that issue. Would you, I just have, left, want to, would you have left D-Day early? I, I didn't go to D-Day. I think what happened was very wrong. I think the Prime Minister has apologised for that. But what I also think is important is we honour their legacy. They fought for our freedom. Unless we are spending the right amount on defence, we can't honour that legacy. The baseline for our equipment programme is 2.5%. If you're not committed to spending that over the period it needs to be spent, you are not funding defence. And I have to just mention also, the cornerstone of our defence is our nuclear deterrent. And you need more than submarines, sailors and warheads to deliver that. You need credibility. And it's too late for Labour on credibility. Angela Rayner voted recently, along with the guy that wants to be your foreign secretary and half the Labour front bench, to end our nuclear deterrent. If Angela you're Rayner doubting that they would use that force, and she might be prime minister in four or five years' time, if you are doubting that she or David Lammy or Keir Starmer would use that, imagine what Putin is thinking. Without credibility, we become a target. If we become a target, you are less safe. It's too late for this generation of Labour politicians. That credibility is shot. Do not vote these people in. Angela Rayner, would you like to respond well, to that? Penny, you can keep pointing at me, but you're the party that have cut the armed forces, crashed the economy and left us in a real mess. Keir has been absolutely clear. I am absolutely clear. We will keep our nuclear deterrent and we will invest in it into it the future. It doesn't matter we what are you're prepared to spend. Clear on that. It doesn't so you matter how many, many submarines you, want, you stand next to and have your that. photograph taken. If your foe does not believe that you will use these weapons, the deterrent is gone. Well, and that's the position you're in. Let, let me, Serious uh, stuff. Let, this let, is what will happen the Tories have if been you elect these people. We've become a laughing stock internationally because of your party. Keir Starmer no, has haven't. changed the Labour Party. We're very clear on our number one priority is you to do protect... Not our let me bring in. Defense. Let me bring in some more. Let me bring in some more parties NATO. on this let question. My brother, no my brother was served in Iraq. I won't be lectured on whether or not I'm absolutely committed to well, the security it's of our country. Then you're not better in. Let the question, Mr. Gottesman's question was: How will the parties ensure our army is ready and our country is safe from another major conflict? Carla Denia, how would the Green Party ensure that? Mm, well, first of all, I want to say we all owe a huge debt to our veterans, those from D-Day and those from conflicts since and it's a tragedy that so many veterans then often struggle in life there's high rates of homelessness and that's something that's a high priority for myself and the greens to tackle in terms of defense more broadly this election is about choosing what kind of country we want to be and of, of course part of that is security we live in uncertain and dangerous times with war on our European borders and major threats from cyber attacks that don't care about geographical boundaries. The threats should not be underestimated. But the biggest threat facing the UK and the world is climate change. And militaries, interestingly, are taking this threat extremely seriously. So in answer, to the, question, know, in answer to the question, how would you ensure our army is ready, do you not want to see the size of the army grow and you do not want to see defence spending go up to 2.5% of GDP? 
Well, let's, let's look for a moment at why we're talking about that number. Uh, as members of NATO, we are rightly asked to contribute a fair amount towards the defence budget. That's totally fair enough for, for NATO to ask for that. But the UK is already contributing the 2% that NATO asks. That doesn't mean, however, that we couldn't be spending that money more effectively. And as Greens, we are clear that um, investing in, in tackling climate threats, the biggest threat facing humanity, as militaries all over the world are already doing because they recognise that if not tackled adequately, it will increase conflict over water, for example, increase famine and create millions okay. of refugees. Let me, let me turn then to Stephen Flynn of the SNP. The nuclear deterrent, the submarines, are based in Indeed. Scotland. You are against maintaining the nuclear deterrent, though. Yes, uh, absolutely. And our party's had a very long-standing tradition in respect of that, because we believe that money can be better spent on conventional defence forces. And what we've seen in Europe over the course of recent years is that how absolutely vital <coughs> conventional defence forces are. But may I just to return to the original question and thank Francis for his father's contribution. We need to be standing with our veterans. We need to make sure that our military is fully funded and that we have more people serving and that we look after them when they become veterans. And just finally on the Prime Minister, a Prime Minister who puts his own political career before public service is no Prime Minister at all. A Prime Minister who puts his own political career before Normandy war veterans is no Prime Minister at all. So it's incumbent upon all of us to do our national service and vote the Tories out of office. Breen mm. uh, your worth of Flight Cymru. Yesterday was a sobering day again, uh, wasn't it, in remembering the sacrifice made on the beaches of Normandy. It certainly wasn't a day for state staged photo ops as we saw from Nigel no, Farage. Hang on a second, yes. I raised £100,000, I raised £100,000 for the London taxi charity to send veterans back to Normandy, that's why I was there, thank you. And it certainly wasn't a day for a Prime Minister to decide, as Stephen said, that his priority should be to fight for his own political future. We have a proud record in Wales of sending young men and women to the armed forces, and we need to make sure that the armed forces are properly funded for conventional uh, deterrence and peacekeeping, and we need to look after those young people when they leave the armed forces with so many problems in housing uh, and, uh, and, and mental health issues and, and so on. But we don't build that resilient conventional force by spending £200 billion on a new nuclear deterrent. Thank you. Uh, Penny Morden, to come back to you, I mean, clearly a, there's been a lot of comment already about the Prime Minister in, in DD and that amount, it amounting to no presence at all. An amounting to... Amounting to no presence at all on D-Day. How did you feel when you realised that so, he had attended the British event and other parts of the day, but he left before the international event at the end of the day? Look, I think what happened was very wrong, and I'm glad the Prime Minister has said that, and he's apologised. He's apologised to veterans, but I think he also uh, has apologised to, to everyone because he was there representing us. And... What I hope is that our veterans will feel treasured and their families will feel treasured at the end of this week. I don't want this issue to become a political football because I think that does them a Well, it already is. It I already is because the veterans themselves are speaking out saying he's let the country down. And to say that it's a mistake, if his instinct was the same as the British people, he would never have contemplated for a moment not being there for the big international ceremony. Let's, let's and it clear. shows how disconnected he is with the people of this country. He's apologised, I, I think and what I would saw, like... I think, I think I, what we saw from the Prime Minister was, was panic, and I think it's the same uh, pre-election panic that uh, gave us that back-of-a-fag-packet plan for a new national service, which those in the armed forces have said that wouldn't be workable, let alone what it means about what the Prime Minister thinks of our young people in this country. Let's be clear about what happened yesterday. It was not only politically shameful, but I think many of us feel personally quite insulted I started yesterday morning watching a recording made by the Royal Mint of my late grandfather, where he recounts catching his best friend who fell from the top of a Sherman tank who was shot in the head. And as he waded through the water, he recounted, in his words, men blown to pieces, hands, legs and heads. Okay. If he had been there yesterday, I'd seen the Prime Minister walk away from him. Okay. 
I would have found that completely, as I do now, find it completely and utterly unforgivable. Okay. Thank you very much for the responses. That was our first question. Let us turn now to our second, and it comes from Ishani Rudra. So, um, I'm about to start studying medicine at the University of Manchester. How will the parties ensure I can graduate into a fully functioning NHS? Thank you, Ishani. So just about to start studying medicine at Manchester University. Uh, Daisy Cooper. Well, first of all, really good luck. Um, I hope it goes incredibly well. We need lots of people uh, signing up and studying uh, to become the medics and our NHS staff of the future. Look, under the Conservatives, our health and social care services have been driven into the ground. And the Liberal Democrats have a very clear plan as to how to fix this. We're going to fix the front door to the NHS with 8,000 more GPs, giving you a guarantee of an appointment within seven days. We're going to put an end to dental deserts. We'll have a mental health community hub in every single community. And we've made a very bold pledge to fix and to offer free personal care. That means you can see, you can get the help you need when you need it. We can fix the back end to the NHS by making sure that if you need to leave hospital, there will be care in What's place. What's the total annual cost of all the changes you're making? So we have set out um, in our manifesto exactly how every single pledge is going to be funded. But we've said right across the piece, across all of our policies, we will not tax struggling families during a cost of living crisis, but we will be looking to those really big companies raking in billions of pounds of profits to support struggling families and to fix our public services. Okay. Health is, of course, a devolved issue devolved to the UK nation. Stephen Flynn, you are in, you know, your party is in charge of health in Scotland. It is a time of record waits and, uh, right, and high numbers of people waiting, for example, 12 hours or more in A&E or 24 months for treatment. How would you ensure that Ishani graduates into a fully functioning NHS? Yes, well, Ishani, good luck uh, to start with. As someone who was under the care of the NHS from the age of 14 to 32, because I was a disabled man, and I physically wouldn't be standing here today but wasn't for the wonderful treatment that I received from the NHS. I know what it is to live in chronic pain and I know what it is to have that chronic pain removed. And it's only thanks to the NHS that happened, which is why in Scotland we don't just have record funding, we don't just have the best paid nursing staff, we don't have no strikes. We don't have a single NHS strike in Scotland. And of course we do have some of the best performing NHS levels in Scotland as well. But given that you're going to university to study medicine, I think it's also important to remind everyone in this audience the difference between the SNP and the Westminster parties. Because in SNP-controlled Scotland, you wouldn't pay a single penny in tuition fees for your studies. What a difference that would make to your education and, and your future. Thank you. Do you do accept that you have record waits for treat treatment at the moment and that there are very high numbers of people waiting 24 months or waiting sometimes as long as 24 hours in A&E? And, and indeed, nobody would seek to dismiss the challenges which exist in our NHS right across these aisles, primarily driven through two issues. One, the backlog from COVID, but secondly, the austerity agenda which is impacting us from Westminster and has done over the course of the last 14 years. And there's £18 billion pounds of cuts coming down the line, agreed to by Angela Rayner and Penny Morden. The Tories and the Labour both know that they're going to cut public sector uh, investment to come, and that's going to have dramatic consequences on the NHS in the devolved nations, because as Wes Streeting himself said, when it comes to NHS waiting times, all roads lead back to Westminster. It's why the cuts that are coming down the line aren't acceptable, and it's why the Labour Party need to change their stance. Angela Rayner, cuts coming down the line? Well, that's not true, because we've said that we'd end the non-DOM loophole. Are you disagreeing with we the would, IFS, Angela? We would end the non-DOM loophole so that we can bring that money in and have 40,000 new appointments every but week. But you're familiar with what, with what Stephen is referring to. The, the IFS saying that both of your parties are not being honest because of the promises well, that you've made to bring debt down. We're going to invest more in the NHS. And then, Ashani, thank you for studying in Manchester. I'm biased, but I'd say it's the greatest city. Um, but I do think that there is an issue that since the Tories took power, I was a home care worker and I represented public sector workers across the northwest and nationally and the decimation of the social care services and the infrastructure around community services has actually not only left us without that community care but it costs more in the NHS far too many people especially our older generation we've just been talking about D-Day and our veterans they're on trolleys for hours on end not getting the care they need but it costs more money to do that so we would put home care services in it costs less to do that and we would have 
around 40,000 new appointments every week in the NHS by making sure we close that non-DOM tax loophole. Uh, the non-DOM the non, the non is not going to close the £18 billion fiscal gap, which the Institute for Fiscal Studies says exists. There is a conspiracy of silence between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party in relation to this. You need to explain to the public how you are going to close that gap without making NHS services worse. We have been very clear that we're going to look at efficiencies as well, so we can have technologies. We would have technologies, technologies, technologies that will come in. We all know that that would help. We've said about the closing the non-DOM tax loophole, which would give us more appointments, whether that's through dentistry, GP, and with hospital appointments. We have the record number of waiting lists in the country now, and it all roads lead to the Tories and what they've done to our public services. And how is your fiscal Penn, plan no, different? Let's get Penny Morden to respond to that. So, um, Manchester is second only to Portsmouth, and we're just about to have both a dental school and a, a medical school uh, uh, very shortly. And good luck with your studies. Your future colleagues are currently dealing with an increase in NHS workload of about 43%. That's the, the legacy of the pandemic that we have to deal with. So there are many things we need to do, Not but there are two the really important things. We have to keep the budget strong. You need a strong economy to do that, and public spending is going to go up. It will go up, and for the NHS, very substantially. The only people on this platform who have ever cut the NHS budget are Labour in Wales. They've cut it four times, and that's why their waiting lists are four times longer than they are in England. NHS not only funding is going you down not when you account for ageing and inflation. A Labour government, the NHS can't afford it either. But the second thing we all also need to do is increase the number of healthcare professionals we have. We have been doing that. We have 70,000 more nurses, for example. But we need to retain people in the service. We've got to take the stress off people, but we also have to remove barriers uh, to them okay, continuing. You, you do service. acknowledge, don't Labour's you, that plans the pandemic is not tax completely your part future of waiting pension, lists. They were rising Senior before. nurses and doctors is going to get healthcare professionals to leave the Penny, service. Penny, that is going to get, lead to more waiting Penny, lists. That, that's but rubbish. And you've just said that we need a strong economy. You backed Liz Truss and crashed our economy. You made people like me redundant <laughs> when we were in the home care service. Even Liz Truss, on her worst day, still recognised that we need a nuclear deterrent in this country, Angela. And so, so do I. Got the and so do I. Okay. But your sons we, do, so we do I. We need to hear, we need to hear from more parties. Up. Penny Morton, I'm going to go to Rena Pureworth next. I'm going to be very nice with Ashani. My life may be in your hands uh, one day, but thank you for studying medicine and do, uh, do enjoy it. I mean, I have a pr privilege of speaking for Wales here this evening, but hopefully what I, what I say will have relevance for people wherever they are uh, in the UK. Um, I think one thing you want is an assurance about what kind of NHS we will have in future. And my party is absolutely clear. Um, the NHS should and must remain free at the point of need. Another key principle for me and Plaid Cymru is that no profit should be taken out of the NHS. We will not consider ever privatising the NHS, something that, of course, the Conservatives want to do, but remarkably Labour are happy to see privatisation within the NHS now too. But, you know, we in Wales have had a double whammy. We've had the impact of the cuts of austerity that absolutely comes down to hitting public services, education and health and everything, plus a very badly managed NHS by Labour. I, in Wales, I whether, do want to whether... point out that you were in a cooperation agreement with Welsh Labour until very recently, until just a few weeks ago, and, and we have record waiting lists in Wales. The, and the NHS was in no way a part of that cooperation agreement because... We do not agree with Labour's approach on the NHS in Wales. My job as an opposition member is to persuade them to make some bold decisions to take us on the right direction. But you know what? You need more than anything, Ashani, is assurance that sustainability will be built in for the workforce within the NHS. Workforce planning and giving you the support through your pay packet, one, but all those other means that show that you are valued as a health worker. OK. Nigel Farage. Whether it's Labour run Wales or SNP run Scotland or Conservative run England, we all know that whilst you can get great care, the NHS model isn't working. You can't get GP appointments, things that we've all grown up taking for granted. And they can argue about, it's all money. I'm going to spend more money. You're going to spend more money. It doesn't work. Just a few years ago, we were spending 7, 7.5% 7 of the national cake <coughs> on the NHS. We're now spending over 11% of the national cake on the NHS. So the answer to Ashani's question, how would you ensure she graduates into a fully, a fully functioning, functioning NHS? NHS, well, I'm going to answer it. Because the more money we spend, the more money we spend, the less delivery we get. Which means the model is wrong. 
The model through which we fund health is wrong. So and this, I would this suggest, is Nigel telling us he doesn't suggest, believe in the NHS. This is what he's doing. He's telling the public he does not believe in the NHS. No, I'm telling you, treasure. I'm telling you, you the funding model, model, it. That is what you and, want and, to and, you, and you in Scotland, of all places, I mean, look, the NHS is very badly run. Let's change the funding no, we'll, we'll model. Not be would you like more private, you'd you'd like more private health care? No, NHS, no, no let's it. change the model. Now, the NHS, it isn't funded through national insurance. That's a nonsense. It goes into the pot. There are countries right next door to us. There's one country, France, that has a very, very different way of funding the NHS. It's rather like those that can afford, through their taxes, pay into an insurance scheme. Those that can't afford it don't pay in, so it's for the mutual benefit of everybody, and it's managed as if it was a private company, and their returns on stroke, heart and cancer are better than ours for exactly the same sum of money. The King's we, Foundation. We get a fully functioning NHS. The King's Foundation. If we spend our money which is a respectable properly, and we're not spending our money properly, and that's the point. Daisy, so we'll have to make it very brief because I need to get to Carla Day. The Hill Foundation, the King's this. Fund, have done an analysis of different funding models. They don't materially make a difference to people's health outcomes. What makes a big difference, most of all, is the amount of money you put into your no. health service. Okay. And no, the Green no, Party, no, and and independent France, experts works. say, I'd France, like, it works. Let's learn from. I'd it. like to hear from Carla Denyer on this. And the Green Party, the party that's ready to be honest about the need for investment, because. Ishani, you're quite right to ask the question and, and thank you for stepping into this important vocation. The NHS has been chronically underfunded for decades. It's on its knees. This cannot be allowed to continue. Most of us agree about that. But the answer is not, as the Conservatives and, surprisingly, Labour think, to invite big multinational companies further into our national health service. The answer is investment and protecting our NHS from And the from money comes from? Well, we announced our health and social care policy just yesterday, and that included a £30 billion increase in funding for our health services, £20 billion on social care, and it's really important that we understand how closely those are linked, because if we have better social care, it takes the pressure off the NHS, and a one-off £20 billion capital investment. These are large fix. sums. Are they, crumbling. They, they, come, are. they come from where? Um, they come from reforming the tax system, because currently the UK tax system is unbelievably unfair. It puts more onus on lower-income working people to contribute to the Treasury than it does towards the super-rich, the millionaires, the multimillionaires and the billionaires. And so the Greens would make some adjustments to that system so that those with the broadest shoulders who can most easily afford to pay quite a modest amount, and that will provide... Plenty of funding for decent investment in public services that benefit all of us. Okay. Thank you, Carlo Denia, and thank you all. <laughs> On to our next question, and this one comes from Lorenzo Barba. Where I live in Essex, I'm struggling to find a house. I've noticed the roads are busier, and it's almost impossible to get a doctor's appointment. Mm -hmm. I think immigration is partly to blame. What are the party parties going to do about immigration? Thank you very much, Lorenzo, for that. And I'm going to turn first to Stephen Flynn. So I accept the, the premise of what you're saying in respect of your area. I'm afraid I don't know it very well. But let me say a few home truths, particularly to some members of this panel. Migration is absolutely essential to our public services. It's absolutely essential to our businesses. And it's absolutely <laughs> essential to our economic growth. And what we need to do is end the demonisation of migration. In Scotland, we have a declining working age population despite a net number of people moving from the rest of the UK to Scotland. We need migrants. And this race to the bottom of, on migration, driven by Nigel Farage, followed by the Conservative Party, party and hotly chased by the Labour Party, does not serve Scotland's interests. And it does not serve your interests either. So rise up against it. Do as Keir Starmer did in 2020 and talk about the benefits of migration. It's important so, to our so fundamental to be, aspects to be, of life To be clear, vote, any voter in Scotland who wants lower immigration should vote for other parties. I think any voter in Scotland who wants to impact our economy, impact our NHS, should vote for the parties who want to cut migration, which is the Labour Party, the Conservative Party and Nigel Farage. And this is a consequence of us being led down the park garden path by the right wing in British politics for far too long. We need to stand against it. We need to promote 
promote our economy, pr promote our public services, and to do so by promoting migration. Okay. Well, Nigel Farage. Well, I mean, I'm on a platform tonight with six other people whose parties have been wholly unconconcerned with the issue of immigration. They think to do even question it somehow makes you a bad person. Let's get back to Lorenzo's question. Let's deal with some logic, shall we? From the end of the 1940s a novelty for you. until Mr Blair got to power, listen to the numbers. You probably don't know them. <clears throat> for 50 years, net migration into Britain was 30 to 40,000 a year. Then Tony Blair gets in, decides to open the doors. We get net migration for the period of the Labour government of 2.7 million people come in that period. Then we get the Conservatives elected in 2010, 2015, 2017, telling us they'll reduce net migration to tens of thousands a year, 4.3 million the Conservatives have led in. Most of those that come in are not directly productive members of the economy. Most of those that come in are actually dependents. And Lorenzo, the truth of it is, this ought to be the immigration election. Because whether we talk about housing, whether we talk about the fact that rents are up between 20 and 30 percent in most of the country in the last four years, whether we talk about the roads, whether we talk about infrastructure, we are living through a population crisis, an increase of 10 million people since Mr Blair came to power, and frankly, it's making us poorer, it is diminishing our quality of life, and it's nothing to do, nothing to do with race or any of those issues, it's to do with actually putting the interests of our communities first. We need to get net migration, and that means, by the way, people come and people go. We need to get met net migration down to an even figure for the next few years, and maybe then we can hope to catch up with housing, with health, and many of those things. Most of those there coming is, is, to the UK today are on work visas or are no, international No, students. about 50% of those that come are dependents. Uh, whether they're coming with work visas... the rules visas, are changing. Family, the rules are changing Family reunions. We've even had, under the Conservatives, so, students coming and bringing their mum. So, 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 I mean, how, I mean, the whole so, thing's been unbelievable. So don't, 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 don't buy this. Unbelievable. Stephen Flynn, you, 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 you've had a say on this. Can I turn to, can I turn to Renap Yorworth, please? Nigel Farage wants to make this an immigration election for his own self-interest. Let, let's change the tone. <laughs> Let's change the tone of the debate on immigration. You know, too much of it is framed around, frankly, the bigotry of people like Nigel oh, Farage. Please. Is that the best you can do? Penny Mordaunt can't Honestly. stand up Honestly. to Nigel Farage because she wants her party to be like Nigel Farage. Well, they're the opposite. Angela Rayner can't stand up to Nigel Farage because of the shift in her party to the right. Plaid Company will stand up to open, Nigel open Farage. Open doors, everyone come. Of course we need everyone rules. Of course we need Benefits rules. Benefits for everybody, lovely. Of course we need rules on borders. Wales really? controlled its own borders during COVID. That's what countries do. But we need those around your know, proper uh, processing of, uh, of asylum uh, applications. We need to stop the vile and expensive Rwanda flights. We need safe passage into this country. And we need to realise that we need immigration for the interests of our health system, our care system and our economy. Penny Morden, do you... <laughs> Respond to Nigel Farage's charge of broken promises from your party on immigration. Well, look, this, this might be an immigration election, but it is definitely going to be a cost of living election. And one thing that we can do to help the gentleman who asked the, the question is about ensuring that you keep more of your money. Uh, we will cut your taxes. Labour will put your taxes up. Was that the if question? If you having more agency, that... you, being oh, able sorry, to get onto the property question. ladder, so that is the... That is any more than I am going to remind you of the question. Election. Lorenzo's question, well, with the, the, problems, to... the problems that he set out, he said, I think immigration is partly to blame. What are the parties going to do about immigration? So immigration is too high. And what we need to do is have a balance between some of the issues that have been raised already. The best way to do this is to get Parliament, your Parliament, elected by you to have an annual cap. What that will do is take into account uh, the economic needs, the needs of the workforce, but also the pressures that immigration puts on communities, as the question uh, uh, made very clear. That will be informed by experts, but it will be Parliament that decides. And because the numbers are too high over the next few years, you can see it will come 
down. That is a clear plan, a clear guarantee. <laughs> we've already ended free movement, we've done many things. That is the logical next step. That's what you get with us. Unlike Labour, who have no plan, they have no target, they have no clue, they haven't done any of the work on the workforce, uh, they've had 14 years to work this out, they have nothing to offer you, controlled numbers and a cap, under us or uncontrolled immigration under the Labour Party. How have you got and the front let, to let, say let, that? Let, let's, let's let Angela Rayner I mean, I mean, respond I mean, to that charge of having no plan. You've only, your party's only said that there'll be a significant cut, but there are no numbers, no time frame attached to that. I mean, I love the spin on that. 14 years and you failed, trebled net migration figures. But what I would say to Lorenzo is that the problems with housing, the roads and GPs and non-public services is decimation that the Tories have done to our public services. Your leader campaign for free but, movement. Keir Starmer, um, Keir Starmer has spent most of his life campaigning for free movement. These guys are not going to control immigration. And we've said that the Rwanda scheme, look, yesterday, 300 people arrived on a boat. One was a six-month-old baby. They could have died going over the, the crossing. We've said we need a new border command. We would scrap the Rwanda scheme, which would have been 300 for the whole year, those by the way. Are, about those, illegal. Those said we those would, numbers are small. Like, we would, they're they're we would small scrap. compared to legal migration We numbers. would scrap the Rwanda scheme. We would put that money into a border force command, You're which will be able to smash the gangs, different. because we need to do that. And... 14 years of the Conservatives, they're relying on overseas to fill our skill shortages because we haven't got an industrial and skill strategy. Labour will put one in place so that we can fill the gaps and make sure that we have people in those jobs. People come to place. this country and they're propping up many of our services because we haven't trained the people to do that. But the this is, of this, this is the how the board of land. The tragedy of this is that Labour wants more and more to talk the language of the Conservatives and, dare I say, Nigel Farage. Keir Starmer said the other day that you know, Rishi Sunak was the most liberal Prime right. Minister I'm, when it comes to immigration. I, they I'm, can I'm, talk, I'm, they can talk our language all they like. I'd, I'd like to hear now from Carla Denia like and from Daisy Cooper. <laughs> so, Lorenzo, your question started by saying, talking about houses, roads and GPs. We need to build 150,000 social homes a year to tackle the crisis in our housing. The roads are in a mess because the Conservatives have cut local authority budgets between 25 and 40 per cent. That's why public services are on their knees. And the Conservatives promised at the last general election to recruit 6,000 GPs. We now have fewer GPs per head right across our country. That's why our public services are on their knees. So and is that's he why wrong to say that he thinks immigration is partly to blame? Well, I would say that actually it's to do with the Conservatives' choices, because at the same time as eroding all of that investment, they've made choices to give a tax cut to the big banks. But on the issue of immigration, I would say the Conservatives have made a complete mess, both of a migration system, but also of the asylum system. And we have the worst of both worlds. We have people who are desperate, who are fleeing war and persecution, arriving on small boats. And at the same time, we have our NHS, our social care, we have hospitality and engineering. None of them can recruit the staff that they need with the skills to boost our economy. So Liberal Democrats have said on care in particular, we should give care workers a higher minimum wage, two pounds higher, invest in our care workers, give them status, give them progression in the workforce. And then when we still have skills gaps, invite people in from other countries and welcome them when they come. Okay. Carla Denia, what would the Green Party do about immigration? First of all, reflecting back to what Nigel Farage said, how cold-hearted do you have to be to not want people who are coming here on work visas to be able to bring their husbands or wives or infant children with them? The so Green Party you would, takes... You would not, you, the Green you would Party not want takes, to cut immigration? The Green Party takes a totally different approach to immigration. When uh, it's hard to get an affordable home, when it's hard to access public services like a GP, when the roads are poorly maintained, I can absolutely understand, Lorenzo, why you're angry about these things. I am too. But I am clear that the reason for these services being run into the ground is not people coming here. Whether they're coming here fleeing violence and persecution as asylum seekers or whether they're coming here to work in many of our understaffed sectors like health and social care. If you meet a migrant in the NHS, they're more likely to be treating you, as I was the last time I saw a GP, than, that, than being ahead of you in the queue. Migration, migration, migration's been a good thing for this country. And so, in the Green Party, our immigration policy is not about arbitrary numbers. 
That's why we're not talking about caps. Instead, it's about making our immigration system fairer and more humane. Carla oh. Denia, thank you very much. So uh, we still have quite a few more questions to come. Meanwhile, I want to mention that online on the BBC Live page, our colleagues at BBC Verify are fact-checking the claims that are made here on stage. And let us turn with that to our next question, which is from Suzanne Ollerton. My husband and I both work. We've got good jobs and we're not eligible for benefits. Our lifestyle isn't extravagant. What we earn goes on gas, electricity, mortgage and food. We are working to survive, not live. This isn't sustainable. Who will change things for working people? Thank you, Suzanne, for your question. Bring up your worth. Change is, is a key word. It's a, it's a change election, uh, isn't it? The, sa the sadness is there'll be a change in Downing Street. I'm quite sure that Keir Starmer will become the Prime Minister in four weeks' time. But what change does that represent? I will always argue that you need a, a plurality of voices making the case for exactly what you're, what you're looking for. What are the answers when you have two parties converging on public spending? converging on taxation, who's going to make sure that you're able to see the investment in housing for your children, to see the investment in uh, getting rid of the two um, child benefit cap in order for parents to be able to look after their children and take children out of, of poverty? I believe that the real frustration in this election is the lack of change on offer from the Labour Party. Whether you liked him or not, there was a feeling. I was still working as a, as a journalist back in the 90s when Tony Blair came in. At least there was a feeling of something different happening. I'm just not sensing that, which is why we in Plaid Cymru say the Tories are gone. Labour are going to come into power. But let's, for goodness sake, make sure that people who feel ignored, as you do, are heard by that Labour Party when they came in. Because change has to mean something. And and What's important. Angela Rayner, bring up your worth charges that change is not really going to come with any Labour government. Well, look, there's been no vote cast at this general election, and Susanna, I absolutely understand what you're saying. The cost of living, you can't escape what's happened. And Liz Trust crashed the economy, which sent mortgages going sky high. We've been at the mercy of the uh, global energy prices and therefore energy prices have gone significantly high for people and also food prices. So Labour's first plan and priority is to secure the economy. We will never go fast and loose with public finances because it's working people who are paying the price for that. And Great British Energy, which is putting a windfall tax on the big oil and gas companies, which will allow us to set up the publicly owned energy company, which will give taxpayers money back, bring down bills and make us secure for our energy needs for the future and create thousands of jobs here in the UK. That is real change. That's how we'll deliver an economy that works for working people. And the Tories should never be allowed to forget that the reason they're in the cost of living crisis now is because they crashed the economy and went fast and loose with the public finances. Penny Mordaunt. So this is what I mean. This is what I mean when I say this election is about the cost of living. And what you have been going through and many other people have been going through, it's exhausting and we need to bring it to an end. We have supported people through some very difficult times. That has been expensive. But we are now in the recovery. The economy is doing much better. We're outperforming America on growth. We're outperforming Europe on inflation. Those are your achievements. But, but the only way we are going to get keep worse. the recovery going is to give you more money in your pockets. That is why this election must be about us cutting your taxes. You think we have reason? already started doing that and you have already heard some announcements. You'll see uh, more in our manifesto next week. We have got to cut people's taxes and we have got to alleviate burdens on business. Angela Rayner and the Labour Party uh, Keir Starmer confirmed this earlier this week. They are going to put up your taxes no, by two thousand pounds. That's a lie. By but two thousand pounds per, per that working household. Your, your government well, what Angela, is it that raised Angela. taxes to what the record level in seventy what years? Is, yeah, the last we have, and we hated putting taxes, taxes up. Taxes. We, have taxes. we have now been cutting taxes. We will continue 
to cut taxes. The country Penny, can Penny Morden, afford it. You're using, using £1,000. Penny Morden, you can't Morden, afford it. You're using, you're using a figure pounds. that's been criticised by the UK by statistics Lies. watchdog. Treasury costings and Labour's Why don't you stand numbers. by your record? And you'll see Record it. levels you'll of taxes on working people. Well, 26 heard, heard separate overnight. tax hikes we've in the last Parliament. about 12 new Taxes That's that rubbish. Labour are going absolute to bring it. It's not rubbish. rubbish. We've well, absolutely it, guaranteed we're, we will not raise taxes for working gap? people can, in can this we, How are we you have going shot? to close <laughs> that gap? <laughs> Two thousand pounds per working household. <clears throat> oh, so I'm, I'm which, I'm going which to... policies are you going to take out of your manifesto? We've been which ones are you how we to... would pay for our manifesto? No, you have okay. It's so time. It's level. It's time. It's time to hear from the others. And Lorena, it's time to hear from the others. Carla Denya. That was terribly dignified, wasn't it? <laughs> Returning to the question, you don't have to be an economist to see that our economy is not working for the majority of people. Penny is talking about a cost of living crisis, and yes, of course, that's what it is, but you might more accurately describe it as an inequality crisis, because actually some people in this country have been doing very, very well. Some people got substantially wealthier during the pandemic while while many of the rest of us struggled. It doesn't have to be like this. We could have well-paid jobs, secure jobs, and a welfare system that really acts as the safety net we need to catch people when they fall. A green economy would create jobs, well-paid jobs distributed all over the country, for example, on a nationwide home insulation programme, which would bring down everyone's bills, help with the cost of living in the here and now, give us warmer, more comfortable homes, create hundreds of thousands of green jobs and support local businesses. And the Greens would provide a real safety net, starting with a £15 minimum wage okay. for all ages, removing the ageist cap on young working adults, an immediate uplift to universal okay. credit mm. and, my final point, removing the cruel Two child benefit cap that both the Conservatives and Labour's party support, even though it holds 250,000 children okay. down in poverty. Thank you, Carla Denia. Nigel Farage. I have to say, I think a lot of working people like you feel quite resentful. The harder you work, the more taxes you pay, the less disposable income you have, and yet there are increasingly people opting just not to work, and that number has rocketed over the course of the last few years. So I understand how you feel. Your energy bills are too expensive. They have been for the last 20 years. Why? Because we load money, we load um, tax onto your energy bill to give to wind farm companies. It's kind of the poorer in society giving to the richer in society. Rents, cost of housing, too high. That links back to the previous question. The population explosion has made housing, whether you buy them or rents, too expensive. Reducing net migration to zero would ease that. Getting rid of those subsidies on your energy bills would ease that. But the big one's taxes. You know, even during Tony Blair's time, the top rate of tax was 40p in this country, and it was paid by one and a half million people. By the end of 2027, eight million people will be paying 40p tax. So we're dragging more and more people doing middle-income jobs into higher and higher taxation. And that's why life is so tough. And to hear Penny Morden, whose government have put the tax burden up, to the highest in this country since 1948, pretending they're a tax-cutting party. Frankly, it is dishonesty on a breathtaking scale. Yes, Stephen Flynn. Look, um, I'm, I'm incredibly sorry to, to hear about the challenges that, that you faced, and it's the same for millions of people right across these aisles, and it's simply not good enough. We know the damage that the Tories have caused to the economy as a result of Liz Truss's Mini budget, but I'm afraid the challenges facing the economy are much deeper than that. Firstly, there's austerity, 14 years of austerity, and I must re emphasize the fact that there's £18 billion worth of cuts baked in, which neither the Labour Party nor the Conservative Party are being on honest about. Instead, they're having the worst of Westminster argument between them tonight, instead of being honest with you about the fiscal outlook going forward. But there's also a conspiracy of silence on one issue, other issue. And that's Brexit, because Brexit has impacted the economy more than the COVID pandemic. It has put your food bills up completely unnecessarily. It has been an unmitigated disaster for the economy. And, and that, 
that, that is why, at this election, you need to ignore the snake oil salesmen who delivered Brexit, and you need to and you need to challenge the Labour Party and the Conservative Party about why they aren't seeking to rejoin the single market, why they aren't seeking to double down on making sure that we return to freedom of and movement, yet, and why we are aren't are investing in our renewables future. And our exports are at a record high. Pe Penny, you know for a fact that Brexit has wiped £40 billion pounds worth of tax receipts out of the UK economy. You did that because you were terrified of Nigel Farage. The, the worrying thing for me, though, is it's not Nigel. It's the silence of the Labour Party when it comes to the damage of Brexit. Silence on £18 billion pounds of cuts, silence on Brexit. The public deserve better, and the SNP will provide it. Daisy Cooper, earlier Stephen Flynn mentioned the austerity years. Your party was alongside the Conservatives in the first part of that. Well, Liberal Democrats fought the Conservatives every single day in coalition, and we just have to look at the damage that the Conservatives have done on their own since 2015. Not only has there been a Brexit, but there has been, uh, you know, this awful uh, mini-budget. And to go back to Suzanne's question, I speak to hundreds of people in your situation, people who play by the rules, people who work hard, people who pay their taxes, and they've almost got nothing to show for it. And on top of that, when they go to use their public services, everything feels broken. Nothing works. And it's, so, and it's, there's a reason why the Liberal Democrats were the first party to call for a windfall tax on the big oil and gas companies, because we saw the raw injustice of these big companies raking in billions of pounds of profits when ordinary folk couldn't afford to pay their energy bills. Okay, we, that is one example of how we will tax fairly in this country. We will need to move on now to our next question. Thank you all for your responses to that one. And our next question comes from Linda Myers. Good evening. Why is it when parties want your vote, they promise things, but when they're elected, nothing gets done? Uh. <laughs> Penny Mordant. Well, <laughs> this is why the Prime Minister made the very clear pledges that he did, and you can measure the progress being made against them. We are making progress in this country. We have been through some very hard times, but the recovery is there. What we must ensure is that that is not choked off, and we must ensure that your taxes are being lowered. That is the pledge that we make to you, and that is what we have been doing with national insurance cuts that we have seen uh, this year. That is what you need. It's not just your taxes that I'm worried about. I'm worried about my constituents uh, being able to afford a Labour government. Angela mentioned a, a GB uh, energy. Do you know what the GB stands for? It stands for giant bills. And more bills are coming with net z the net zero plans that <coughs> Labour have. That is the most important thing, because everything depends on you having that disposable income. And that is why tax is at the heart of this. The pledges that we are making to you on cutting your taxes and what Labour will not tell you about the taxes they are going to be putting but up. But personal the taxes, Penny Mordaunt, are still rising. Overall, they are still rising due to the freezing of income tax thresholds that you've brought in. Look, we, we have had some very difficult times. We have had to spend a lot of money on things like furlough. That was the right thing to do, to keep jobs and livelihoods going, not just hand out welfare payments. The pandemic has been expensive and we've also had terrible global shocks. We've had to step in and pay people's energy bills. But we are coming through that thanks to your efforts. What you need now is disposable income in your pockets. You need taxes to be cut. We have announced already we're making cuts on your taxes regarding your home, uh, your pension, work. We need to continue to do that. If you get us, we will reduce your taxes. That's in our DNA as Conservatives. That's not what is in Labour's DNA. They always put up taxes. They're going to put yours up by £2,000. They're going to increase your energy bills, and you're going to get a whole lot of costs with their net zero plans. My constituents cannot afford that. Okay. You Penny, cannot afford Penny that. Penny well, I'm going to stop you there, and I'm also going to point out that the top civil servant in the Treasury said that the Conservative document that included um, the costs that you're referring to went beyond those provided by the civil service. Nigel Farage. Well, Linda, 
I have to say, I think this has been one of the worst general election campaigns so far between the two main parties I've ever seen in my lifetime. It isn't just that their leaders are dull, uh, don't clearly, clearly, well, very dull in the case of Labour. I mean, sort of, sort of Blair without the flair. I mean, the real leader of the Labour Party is here tonight on the stage. At least she's got some personality. Um, we've got Rishi Slippery Sunak. You know, he's, he's fed all the lines to Penny Morden. Don't believe any of it. I think it isn't just our public services that are broken. I think our political model is broken. The arguments that are going on on the other side of the room here, when the truth is, they don't really disagree on anything. Fictitious numbers like £2,000, £3,000. And that's why reform have risen so quickly in the polls. There is a sense we need a revolt against this system. We need an electoral system where we get some proportional representation in Parliament. We need to break up the current model. And if we get a new kind of politics in Britain, we might just get some real change. What we're being offered, frankly, are two parties promising the earth and nothing much will change, regardless of who gets in. Although, I think, the breach of trust on manifestos with the Conservatives means they're probably sunk below the waterline. <clears throat> new politics, fresh start. We want a revolt from the British people. That's what I'm after. Angela Rayner, has <laughs> Labour gone back on any of its pledges? Well, to be fair, it's always all about Nigel, and we've had this sort of clown personality before with Boris Johnson, who you talked about the pandemic, Penny, who was uh, breaking lockdown rules and spending billions of pounds yeah, and money on crony contracts. I'm going to remind you of the contracts. question. When you parties want about... your vote, they promise things. When they're elected, none of it gets absolutely. done. Absolutely. And Linda's absolutely right, and I was coming back to that point, because that eroded people's trust. At a time when people wanted the government to do the right thing, they didn't. They Have you ever dropped any pledges? They disrespected them. And we've, we set out the pledges before the crash. The Tories have crashed the economy. We've been honest in this election. People talked about some of the things that they would like us to do, like the two-child limit. We have been clear, we will not promise anything that we cannot fund. And we've been absolutely clear. You could the fund Tories it, you're choosing have a not record, to. The Tories have record number of tyke, tax hikes on working people of this country. Labour, if we get in, will not put taxes up for working people of this you country. Are. And you're Labour won't look them up. Carla, I'm, 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 going, I'm going to... I'm, Penny Morden, you've Kirsten had your say on this. Been honest. Carla, he said Carla, this week, Penny Morden, going thank you. Your Carla Denia, you're next. He is going to put them up Penny by Morden, £2,000. No, we didn't. We're going to, sure, I'm stopping you. Yeah. Thank rubbish. you. That's your point. Linda, I share your frustration. When I was younger, I had little to no faith that politics had the potential to, to make the country a better place. But let's remember politics at its root is about people. It's about people's lives, people's bank accounts, people's future, people's health and happiness. And that's why, after meeting some Green Party members in my in my 20s, I realised that the Green Party is different. That's why I joined, that's why I got involved. Now, as several of the other panellists have already pointed out, as Labour drop pledge after pledge, policy after policy, slide further and further towards the Conservatives so that you can barely get a cigarette paper between them, the argument for voting for a bit of diversity in the House of Com Commons becomes ever stronger. And in terms of answering your question, Linda, about... Um, about parties keeping their promises. The Green Party, when I joined it in 2011, was a pretty small and young party, but we're coming of age. We have uh, increased our number of councillors nearly fivefold over the last few Thank local you. elections, and we're grateful you, to everyone the, the, who's the, put their trust the in us. The question was about uh, pledges. Stephen Flynn. Uh, if we want to talk about pledges, then in a Scottish context, I can provide you with a few that have been delivered. 100,000 children in poverty are being lifted out of... Uh, 100,000 children in Scotland are being lifted out of poverty thanks to what's called the Scottish Child Payment. It doesn't exist <coughs> anywhere else on these aisles. The SNP has put it into and place. So our, our young people, of course, do not pay a single penny in tuition fees. We've got something which I know the audience in Scotland would love to have, which is a nationalised water company. That are, there any pledges, water. are there any pledges you haven't met the, the, the in S government? The SNP have also delivered nationalised rail, 40% more affordable homes than in England, 70% more than in Wales. And ultimately, it's about keeping our promise to the Scottish people. But I would actually contest, I would say the Labour Party and the Conservative Party 
are being very honest with you about what the future holds. The problem is, it's £18 billion pounds worth okay, of public sector cuts. But you said, just, cuts, not, just not because the question was on pledges, one Brexit, of your pledges, wasn't enough. it, that you would close the attainment gap in a decade between pupils from the richest and most deprived areas of Scotland. Today, it remains considerable. And indeed, we're making significant pro progress in relation to that. But of course, poverty and the attainment gap are interlinked. And the levers of power over poverty are determined by Westminster, okay. because all roads do indeed lead back to Westminster. Rena Purewith. I think Linda's question is largely around integrity and the loss of, of trust. I've been around politics for around 30 years, 20 of that as a journalist. And as a journalist looking from outside, I could see the apathy and I could see the cynicism. You know, the cynicism driven by Downing Street COVID parties. You know, the cynicism driven by a leader of government in Wales accepting a £200,000 payment from a convicted environmental polluter <laughs> who is looking for planning permission from the government and refusing to see that that looks wrong in people's eyes. We need to rebuild that kind of trust. And two words, honesty and fairness. Honesty, you know, the unedifying rows between the Conservatives and Labour Party here on, on taxation this evening. We have to have honesty about taxation. We can't drive taxation forever down and expect to have high levels of public services, can we? And fairness, we have to have a system that protects people like you. Why should Rishi Sunak, on his two million pounds income, largely from investments, pay less tax than you do on hard graft going out to work during the day. That's the kind of fairness, or the unfairness, I should, su I should say, within the taxation and, system and I want to, that really undermines I, trust. I want to get in a word now from Daisy Cooper on this. We heard promise after promise after promise from the Conservatives at the last general election. 40 new hospitals, 6,000 GPs, and all the rest. And the fact is that this parliament has been characterised by law-breaking, by lying, and by the economic illiteracy of the mini budget and of all the things that the Conservatives have broken, the worst thing that I think they've broken is people's hope. Do you remember going back on the tuition fees pledge? <laughs> <laughs> That's a sore subject for us, for sure. Like, that was a, that was a very difficult uh, decision. But let's remember that it was the Conservatives who, in 2015, withdrew the maintenance grants for, people, for young people from the lowest backgrounds, uh, which has now stopped many of them from going to university. Okay. But my point well, is that this election is about hope and it is about change. Many of us do come into politics for the right reason. And for any of you who have seen the party political broadcast by Ed Davey talking about his experiences as a carer for his disabled son, you will be in no doubt that he is in politics for the right reason and that we are committed to fixing the NHS. Thank you all. Care. And I'm going to go to our next question, which is from Lucy Hobday. What matters to you more? economic growth or successful climate policy? <laughs> Thank you very much, Lucy, for that question. Nigel Farage. Well, it depends what those climate policies are. And at the moment, we're pursuing completely unrealistic climate policies. I mean, the Labour pledge to decarbonise the grid by 2030 will not happen, just as the Conservative pledge to decarbonise the grid by 2035 will not happen. Not only is it impossible, it's actually unaffordable. So we have to be grown up and sensible. If we get new technologies that give us cheaper energy or better ways of manufacturing things, that's great. But what we're doing in this country is we're sacrificing economic growth. We're, we've been massacring British manufacturing. And we say to ourselves, isn't it marvellous? We've reduced carbon emissions more than any other Western country. But we haven't. All we've done is to export carbon emissions when our steel works go to India, or our car manufacturer moves to China, or to Turkey, or wherever it is. And we're living in a complete fool's paradise on all of this. I mentioned earlier to the lady at the back about the cost of living. You know, we've been chucking 20% on people's electricity bills now for 20 years to pay for very inefficient wind energy. So what's really happening with net zero, what's happening with the attempt to deal with climate change, not that we can, because we produce less than 1% of the world's carbon dioxide. And the Chinese are building 80 new coal-fired power stations every year. We okay. should not, we should not forget we're going to need oil and gas for the next 30 years. We will be using okay. oil and gas Thank you, Nigel Farage. I'm, so gonna, let's just, I'm going to turn let's now just to be sensible Carla Denia about what next we do. Net zero topic. is a bad policy what, and it's bad for people. What matters to you more, economic growth or successful climate policy, was the question. Carla Denia. Well, Nigel's going to keep your fact-checkers busy for a little while. 
Nigel Farage has been misleading you. I'm an engineer. I used to work in the renewable energy sector. I know very well how wind farms work. So much of what he said there is simply untrue. Subsidy. Everyone knows that they can't trust the Conservatives or reform when it comes to climate. And Subsidy. that's part of the reason why the Conservatives are on their way out at the general election. Hang on, let her answer. But what people have been saying to me on the doorsteps in my home city of Bristol and elsewhere is that they're sorely disappointed in the Labour Party too, who've rolled back on their previously flagship climate investment pledge, one of the few good policies they had left, when it's totally clear that we need to tackle the climate crisis and that doing so brings so many other benefits. Insulating our homes, a nationwide home insulation programme will bring down our bills, give us warmer, more comfortable yeah, homes. Let me, let me get Angela Rayner to, to respond to that. You've, you've dropped that £28 billion a year green investment pledge earlier this year. Well, we said we want to uh, get to that point, but we will invest in our green prosperity plan because, as Lucy's question was put to us, actually, we do need to look at economic growth and it's not divorced from also looking at climate policies. We can't ignore the fact that we do have to change. And Nigel says we have to use oil and gas, and you're right, and we've, we've recognised that, that that will be part of the future, but it won't be forever. So we do have to have a green transition, and that's what our green prosperity plan is all about, about creating those jobs insulating homes and having our self-reliant energy needs for the future through Great British Energy. Stephen Flynn, the SNP. Yeah, I think it's probably worthwhile starting by addressing the question head on. Net zero is economic growth. And it's not GB energy, it's Scotland's energy. It's Scotland's wind, it's Scotland's waves, it's Scotland that's going to provide the carbon capture and storage, and it's Scotland that's going to create the green hydrogen economy of the future. The Americans are investing in it, Europe's investing in it, the Middle East and beyond is investing in it. And the UK needs to invest too. The opportunities are huge, but we have to grasp them. And I'm afraid that what we're seeing at Westminster is a betrayal of the future generations. The Labour Party walking away from £28 billion worth of investment, which would have been transformative. With the SNP, you will get that commitment to a just transition to reaching net zero, to protect and create new jobs for the future. And, and what just does one... that mean for oil and gas in the North Sea? And I was actually just going to come to that, helpfully enough, because what Angela has said there in relation to oil and gas, so there's three positions at the moment. There's a Conservative Party position that oil and gas is going to exist forever. I'm afraid it's not, and I can say that with some certainty, given where, of course, I live. The Labour Party position is to shut down the North Sea oil and gas sector, which would risk 100,000 jobs. Not my numbers, independent experts in what the Unite Union call putting people on the scrap heap. There is a sensible middle ground which allows us to invest in net zero, protect the jobs of tomorrow, and that's what the SNP are focused you were, on. Okay. You were in I'm... agreement. You didn't want to put a levy on the oil and gas companies. That's not true, Andrew. We talked about a transition. You're, we you're we talking recognise, about lying, and that's not we true. Need, we recognise that we need a transition from oil and gas, and that's what the Green Prosperity so how, Plan how, is all about. And that's why, the, that's, so, that's why we put the levy on oil and gas companies to then have Great British Energy, <laughs> which will give us the jobs for the future. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs across the UK, including in Scotland, where Great British Energy's headquarters well, will be based okay, under the Labour government. I'm going to now, I'm gonna now turn may, to Daisy that, Cooper. If I may address that Democrats. directly, because it was pointed towards me, that we should not be grateful in Scotland for a headquarters. It is our energy. 100,000 jobs on this are on the line topic as a result of your policy. And there will, will be more jobs. There will be more jobs Daisy, in Scotland under our plan. 100,000 jobs There will be more jobs than 100,000 okay. in Scotland Shameful. under Labour. Can, can we bring Daisy so, Cooper in now? Thanks. The Conservatives have moved the goalposts on climate targets. And what's that done is that has brought uncertainty to the heart of business and people who want to invest in our country and our climate transition. We are facing a climate and ecological emergency, but we don't have to make a choice between economic growth and tackling the climate emergency. We can do both hand in hand, we really can. So take the example of having a home insulating scheme, an emergency home insulating scheme. That would not only reduce our energy usage, which would be good for the climate, it would reduce our energy bills, which would be good for our pocket, but it would also create a huge raft of new jobs as well, people who could actually go around insulating our homes. So we can do both of them hand in hand, and that's precisely what we need to do. OK. Uh, Rune up your worth. Uh, nothing is more important than looking after the environment that you will be living in uh, in future. Uh, there is 
not a matter of making a choice in Wales as it happens. Um, we can create that economic prosperity that we need to build a brighter future for our country, hand in hand with looking after the environment. It is why Plaid Cymru calls for the devolution of the Crown Estates, as has happened to Scotland, but they won't do it to Wales, so that we can invest in making the most of our natural resources, in extracting power out of the wind and, and, and the tide. It's why we need to see Wales being paid the £4 billion that is owed of uh, the investment in HS2 rail in England. Wales is contributing towards that, even though there's not a mile of that railway uh, in Wales. Um, and we need that in order to drive people onto public transport through uh, investing in, in connectivity in Wales. And you know what? I'm not surprised hearing the Conservatives refusing to make that commitment to Wales, but it's galling when you have a Labour government in Wales that Labour won't either. Uh, Penny Morden. Done well, both should help the other. What is critical, though, is if you want to reach net zero by 2050, you have to do it with people. You have to ensure that people can afford to get there. If you don't do that, you will fail to reach your targets. We are going to do this at a pace that people can afford. 2050 sounds a long way off, and in this election, you're looking at the next five years. At the end of this parliament, if they get in, you will not be able to buy a petrol car. If your boiler goes, you'll have to spend tens of thousands of pounds on uh, a new heat pump, other things that need uh, to be done to your home to convert it. My constituents cannot afford that. You heard about because uh, of your GB policies. Energy. You heard about GB Energy. This is an energy company that your money is going to be put into that doesn't produce any energy at all. It doesn't produce a job of energy. <laughs> Oil and gas. <laughs> This is the insanity of Labour's policy. They are expecting a load of people to invest in oil and gas at the same time saying they're not going to expand the sector. So they're not going to get the money in. And the final thing, if you do this too fast, all you do is destroy our supply chain. We should be building supply chains in this country to produce batteries, to do all sorts of things. Let, let, if you let's do get Angela to speed Labour a planet, let, 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 let Angela the country respond, that will benefit Penny Morden, is China. To what you've and that said. will kill off economic growth. Let's hear the response. I mean, it's astonishing. How much energy is it going to produce? It's astonishing because the Tories have been in power now 14 years. How much years, energy is Great British Energy going to produce? And we haven't had an industrial strategy or a manufacturing sector in the UK that is you about creating... You just said creating, it's going to produce energy. About I've just, How much just energy listen, is We just listen to you, Penny. I'm, 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 I think it's pretty answer? important. You're flogging an energy company to these guys. You're expecting them to put their money she's in. Mid, she's mid-response. Let's hear it. Thank you. Great British Energy will be an owned company by the UK taxpayers that will bring energy, clean energy, to the country, which will bring down bills and give people good, skilled jobs. <clears throat> We've heard from the Tories for 14 years that they were going to do something about skills and manufacturing in this country. I asked the people to look at their record and they constantly spout these lies that we're going to stop people's cars, that we're going to do this, going to do that, when really the reason they say that is their 14 years uh, abstract failure. And are your green abstract policies going to be you in your You have manifesto. failed the British people. Are your green policies going to be You have failed the British manifesto. people, and people can see that. Because you currently can't afford to pay for them. Okay. Our and that's where that two thousand pounds comes from. That you're all going to have to pay. And I'm going to and, and I'm going to turn to on their green policies, and they're going to hit you on the. Cost and I'm going to turn to the next question at this cost. point. And the next question comes. Oh dear. They the next. Disagree. They agree. The actually. next question. It's the show. It's let's, get, let's get the next question. It's from Nick O'Donnell. As a father with a young son about to start secondary school, I'm concerned about him going out on his own. I'm particularly worried about knife crime. How will the parties make sure he's safe? Thank you very much, Mr O'Donnell. So how will the parties protect future generations like Nick O'Donnell's young son who's about to start secondary school? Carla Denia. Nick, we all have the right to feel safe in our homes and on our streets. My home city of Bristol has seen an epidemic of knife crime. One of my colleague's friends was one of those victims, so this strikes very close to home for me. There are obvious things that could be done in terms of making sure that there's more officers out and about, but the other parties will also, I expect, tell you that they'll be tough on crime. How Tough many more police officers would you, would you want as you've brought policing into it? Our manifesto will be out soon, but the broad points I can cover now. Tough on crime 
is a rhetoric that we hear a lot from other parties. But the reality is that not all crime can be tackled by being tough. And that's something that the Green councillors in Bristol, the largest council in the country that's Green-led, are prioritising. Because the causes of knife crime are complex, but they include the fact that a generation of, of young people are growing up without access to the services they need. Youth centres are being closed. Pr services that they need to support them. OK, the, I, the, the, quest, the, the question specifically on knife crime, which is yes. up in England and Wales by 8% since 2019. Nigel Farage, how Stop would you predict? Search. Stop and search. We know the areas in which knives are most prevalent. Stop and search. And, of course, we don't do it. Oh, gosh, if this area has got a high proportion of people from the black and ethnic minority communities, they might call us racist. We've got to stop doing this. We've got to completely forget the colour of people's skins, treat everybody equally, but we must do stop and search. We must do it in a very, very tough way. We have to have proper sentences. And, and it's but one area, isn't it? I mean, you can go shoplifting now, any of you. You can go out and nick up to 200 quid's worth without being prosecuted. We are seeing a decline a societal decline of law and order in this country and, frankly, government and the police forces have been too scared to do what needs to be done. It's yet another area of Britain that is broken and needs radical surgery. Daisy Cooper. I know many parents who were really very scared about the safety of their um, children. Um, it's not only a big issue here in London, but particularly in the home counties, on county lines, there's a big issue uh, with knives as well. I think we need to change the model of policing and we need to get back to good old-fashioned community policing, where the police know their communities, where the communities know their police, where community groups, where faith groups, where uh, local families all work together and they get their intelligence from the ground up. That's been all but wiped out in parts of our country. There's been cuts of four, four and a half thousand uh, PCSOs as well. And let me say about Stop and Search in particular, Stop and Search can be a useful tool in some circumstances, but suspicionless stop and search, which has been used to, um, has been used to target particular uh, groups of people, is not valid and should not be used. So where there is a suspicion of somebody, it can be used, but it has to be used in a targeted way based on evidence, not on profiling. Nigel well, Farage? No, we do know the areas in which knife crime is the most prevalent, and there is no question you know, that we are scared. And those are the areas if, with the most if inequality, a high, if which a is why tackling inequality community. is an important part well, of well, the that, answer. that may be what you have to do to solve the problem ultimately, by giving people equality of opportunity. Do we not want to solve the problem ultimately? Is that people, not the point? But you can't give people equality of outcome. You, 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 oh, we're scared of our own shadow here. We're not going to deal with the question unless we stop being scared of ourselves. Okay. We go out and do what needs to be done. Penny Mordant, how would you protect future generations from knife crime? Well, over the last 14 years, if you, if you leave out uh, computer uh, crime and online fraud, we have more than halved crime, 55%. And this we have now is about a record knife crime. number of police. Violent crime is down by 44%. But we have hotspots, where, and knife crime in particular. London is top of the list. We have put more police on the streets. We have met our manifesto commitment of 20,000 more police officers. We have record numbers. And where you have Conservative Police Crime Commissioners, like my area in Hampshire, you have local bodies Actually, on the Actually, West beat. Midlands We've has got the a... highest rate of knife crime. Absolutely. And that has had a, a, that, that a that did Police until, Crime Commissioner That did until well. recently if have are, a Conservative mayor. If you are in... Uh, but he wasn't responsible for police. There was, a, uh, there was a police oh, crime yes. commissioner and it was Labour. If you live in a Labour area, you are 40% more likely to be a victim of crime. That is a shocking statistic. We need more police and we need police who are embedded in communities that can follow up with people. If kids are doing stuff, they follow up with the school, they follow up with the parents. That's what Conservative Police Crime Commissioners are doing. In Hampshire, we've got 600 extra officers. Every single one of my wards has a named Bobby. Okay. People know, build up intelligence. That is how we get crime down, and we have got it down by 55%. Angela Rayner? Well, Nick, thanks for the question, and I think our young people don't feel safe either at the moment, never mind us as parents, and I say that I've got a 15- and 16-year-old sons at home, and I think it's really sad when I go around my schools and I talk to young people, they're frightened of what they think is crime on, on their streets, and young people who are 
worried about knife crime generally tend to carry a knife to protect themselves but are more likely to actually uh, be involved in knife crime because of that. We've got to educate our young people and that means that we've got to have uh, those neighbourhood police. We've had them cut. We said we put 13,000 more neighbourhood police on the street. Penny talked about 20,000 police officers. They cut 22,000. That's a minus 2,000 in my mathematics. So they haven't protected That's not true. We've people. got a record number we, of police officers. We, we have seen the decimation of our neighbourhood policing. And actually, when police are in the neighbourhoods, they get to know the young people, they can work with them, and we can really get our young people feeling safe on the streets again. Because I think that is one of the real scandals at the moment, is our young people feel that they will be protected if they carry a knife. That is completely untrue. And we've got to educate them and make them feel safe again. Bring up your worth. Penny Morden was referring to some areas having uh, higher levels of crime than, than others. Let, let's, be, let's be straight about it. It's areas which are suffering most poverty that will suffer the highest levels of crime. It is people who have less hope who are most likely to end up uh, leading criminal lives. I absolutely agree that we need to look back through uh, the education system. We have to make it very, very clear to our young people that there can be zero tolerance on, on knives. I was attacked as a, as a teenager. Luckily, no, no knives. My son was attacked a couple of years ago. Again, luckily, no knives involved. But it makes me too very, very worried about uh, the future for young people. But for us in Wales, what's absolutely key is that we bring the decision-making closer to communities such as yours so that we can see the devolving of justice and policing so that we can devise systems that work for Wales. <laughs> Angela's Labour colleagues in Wales agree with me on that. Again, Labour at a UK level, hoping to become the next government, say no, no chance. Briefly, Carla, before I turn to Stephen Flynn. I've signed the Citizens UK pledge for a counsellor in every school to help with young people's mental health and with youth violence. Will the others on the panel today join me? Well, we already committed that we'd have mental health services in schools. That's one of our commitments. Stephen Flynn, on the um, broader question of policing, police officer numbers in Scotland are at the lowest level since 2008. Now, police in Scotland are not investigating every low-level crime. And thankfully, of course, Nick, in relation to your direct question. If I remember the figures correctly, serious knife crime in Scotland is comparatively low compared with many other areas. Now, that's not to be complacent, because as a dad, I, I share your concerns. I worry about what the future holds for my kids. But ultimately, the solution lies in what Reen has said. What we need to do is make sure that we are investing in the areas that need support the most. Poverty is a major driver behind this, and Westminster has failed generations of young people by not providing them with the hope for a better future. So they turn to violence when they perhaps shouldn't. And I think that's something we should all reflect upon going into this general election, where £18 billion of public sector cuts are coming down the line and a future Labour government has no answers. But this question was about how the parties are going to protect future generations like, um, like Nick Donald's Nick O'Donnell's son, how can he feel confident of that if someone in a similar position in Scotland see the police not investigating every crime? Well, well of course, as I've already outlined, uh, as I understand it to be the case, serious knife crime instance and instances in Scotland are comparatively low in comparison to elsewhere. But our police officer numbers are, of course, still higher than when we came into government, again, if I understand correctly, but there's a wider picture to be had here, and that means police officers working with local communities, working with schools, working with our young people to offer them hope and optimism for the future, and I'm, ashamed, I'm afraid that Westminster doesn't offer that hope and optimism right now. Okay. Nigel Farage. Yeah, look, you know, again, I just think our whole approach to crime is wrong. Low-level crime is rapidly growing. Street-level crime is rapidly growing. And, and, you know, the old theories, the old theories about New York and how it was cleaned up, it was if you deal with the stuff at the bottom, i.e. people carrying knives, shoplifting, graffiti, broken windows, you might just deal with the more serious stuff. I think we also should add into all of this the blight of drugs and drug gangs in our cities. That whole culture uh, it has been absolutely disastrous and nobody, but nobody has yet found the answer to that. OK, well... 
That was our final question. So I'm going to thank you all for your responses to all of those here in the audience who have shared their questions with us. Um, but it is time now to go to the party's <coughs> final thoughts. And um, that for that, they have been given 30 seconds for a final thought from each of them. <coughs> and the order of those final thoughts, those final statements, was chosen earlier by Lot. So let us go to the first of those. And it's from Angela Rayner. After 14 years of chaos, it's time for change. Keir Starmer has changed the Labour Party. Our fully costed plan for Britain will secure our economy, will bring down NHS waiting times with 40,000 new appointments every week and will secure our borders, not with gimmicks, but with a credible plan to smash the gangs. We'll create great British energy, bringing down bills and creating thousands of well-paid jobs. We'll boost neighbourhood police to tackle antisocial behaviour and we'll hire 6,500 new teachers. So if you want change, vote Labour. Stephen Flynn. The Tories are finished, so the choice is simple. Who do voters best trust to put Scotland's interests first in Westminster? Now, in the SNP, we know what it is that we believe in. Investment in our NHS, action on the cost of living crisis, rejoining the European single market and creating economic growth by, by um, delivering on net zero. Unlike the Labour Party, we will never, ever get comfortable with the Westminster status quo. We will always fight for Scotland's right to choose its own future. So on the 4th of July, vote to put Scotland's interests first. Vote SNP. Carla Denia. We can all see the Tories are toast. Thank goodness. <coughs> but we deserve better than a Labour Party that is offering more of the same. Angela says that Keir has changed the Labour Party. And she's right. He's changed them into the Conservatives. <laughs> Frankly, our children deserve better. The Green Party is on the cusp of breaking through in seats up and down the country. Green MPs will never stop defending our future, protecting our NHS from privatisation and pushing the next Labour government to do better. We deserve real hope and real change. Vote Green. Rena Purewood. This evening, I've been able to stand up for Wales, yes, but also for a different kind of politics that hopefully has been able to feel relevant wherever you are. My vision is a positive one. This isn't as good as it gets. The Conservatives are gone, they are finished, and it can't come quickly enough. But there is a real chance here to send Labour a message too. Stop taking Wales for granted. It is true that communities throughout the UK feel as if they are being ignored. Well, I won't let Wales be. So vote Plaid Cymru on the 4th of July. Penny Mordant. We've come through tough times and now there is a choice to be made. You can choose Angela Rayner and Keir Starmer and get higher taxes, higher bills and have your pension raided. Or... You can stick with us and the plan that is working. We will cut your taxes. We will protect your pension. And we will defend this nation. For a more secure future, vote Conservative. Daisy Cooper. Our country is crying out for change. And it's not hard to see why. Under this Conservative government, everything feels broken. Nothing works. Under Ed Davies' leadership, the Liberal Democrats will fix our NHS and social care, tackle the cost of living crisis and put an end to the scandal of filthy raw sewage being dumped in our rivers and streams. Every vote for the Liberal Democrats is a vote for a fair deal and a vote to help deliver the change that we all so desperately want and need. Nigel Farage. Unlike the other six, I don't need an all queue. I'm here mean, because I believe in what I believe in. <laughs> Our politics isn't working. You've heard these pathetic arguments tonight between the two big parties. Really, there isn't much difference. But electorally, Labour are going to win. The debate is who forms the opposition in the next parliament? Who fights for the rights of ordinary British people? Who fights to control our borders? Who fights for men and women running small businesses? Reform UK is about to become a political phenomenon, an historic one. So I urge you, join the revolt. 
Thank you very much. Thank you all. And with that, we ended. That is it from the BBC election debate from all of us here in the radio theatre, our audience. And thank you to all the politicians who took part. Thank you for being with us. Good night. Commemorate D-Day, 80 years on. A collection of special programs from those who were there.